together welcome to our service tonight, number 34, in your songbook there please, number 34, how great thou art, oh let's lift it up, give it all you have, praise God Almighty, on the first together now, oh. schedule. Man, I'm glad our God's a great God. Amen. It's good to be in church on Wednesday night. I'm glad that you're here this evening looking forward to what God's going to do. Amen. And uh, God's been good to us this week, hadn't he? Amen. A lot of places all over the world, people could care less whether God ever spoke to them or not. But I believe there's a crowd here tonight that wants to hear from heaven. Yeah. The great thing about it is God wants to hear from us too. So let's yeah. pray and get, get God in on this thing tonight and ask him to move in power. Lord, I pray that you please bless the service this evening. I pray that you would please uh, help us to hear from you. I pray the Holy Spirit of God would have right away to work and move in every heart. Anoint the singing. I pray that you give power to the preacher. I pray everything that's done would be glorifying, uplifting, and pleasing to your name. I pray that you stir us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
down a memory lane of paths so long ago. Old Satan came right by my side, making me feel low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Sixty-seven, please. Two sixty-seven. Praise God for that song. Hallelujah. Oh, here's another one. Y'all buckle up. We're gonna have a good time. Amen. I stand redeemed on the first together now.
save knowing Christ. John said he's precious while standing by his side. So for a moment, may I humbly testify. Lord, good night, win. 
a hard top with a daring departure in design that shows the 57 version of America's most popular car as fleet and fresh. Note Chevrolet's brilliant new high fashion fender design. I love these cars of the 50s. I can recall my father allowed me to go across the street in Stockton, California to chase Chevrolet and to Eagle Ford, the Buick Pontiac dealer in 1959. I was a young boy. I spent the entire day. I saw those cars, those Cadillacs, and I saw one picture where it was this way, straight up and down. It was amazing seeing it in that vertical position. It was a take off the space age. Boy, they had those big wings. It was amazing. These cars were so special. Look at this beautiful chrome. How it begins here and begins to flare out. No generation of cars ever have looked like this ever since. It was breathtaking. You know, this brings beauty, the chrome and the bumpers and all the outfitting of the chrome on the vehicle. The chrome brings beauty. In our lives, there's the beauty of the love of God. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. There are certain things that should remind us that we see a beautiful car like this. Do I have kindness in my heart? Do I have love for people? Am I patient with my wife, my husband, my children, God's people? As this car exudes itself with beauty, so that ought to be part of the Christian life. When I was a teenager, we would sing, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. As you see a vehicle like this this year, you see the beautiful chrome and how it's outfitted. May it be a reminder to be beautiful for Christ in all that we do. I'm so burdened for my church to buy me a car like that. We're going to give an invitation for the members of our church right now and for all rich pastors to help me in this endeavor. Uh, thank you for watching the various videos this week. As we prepare for the offering, as we prepare for the offering, I, 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 silence, this is not a silent time. The Lord loveth the cheerful giver. That means one who acts like a clown at the circus. It's a happy time. It's a shout time. It's a praise the Lord time. It's a reach in your wife's purse time. Let's get something in our pocket, in our hand right now, and let's get ready. It should be green. What is a $100 bill? Who's on the picture of a $100 bill? Who is? Ben Franklin. Get some Ben Franklins out. What about the $200 bill? No such thing, probably. Is there a $1,000 bill? Is that still around? I know in Tennessee there won't be anything like that. They're just happy to have the Internet. And uh, they don't have it yet, but they do have light bulbs right now, right? Brother Ampli, what a message this morning. I was telling the shuttle driver, I got on the bus tonight uh, to come on over, and I said, you have to hear it. And uh, Brother Johnson uh, started it off this morning. Wonderful, wonderful, just a wonderful message. And then Brother Effley, what fire and zeal, both of them today, just really so compatible. And I want to thank you, and I want to thank, I thank you so much for coming this year. Um, I, I never know how many years we're going to have this. I know there's a date for next year, so I'm planning on it. And by the grace of God, if he tarries, I hope we're alive and to be here next year, one more year. We'll just take it year by year, see what God has. But it's wonderful to see how that you come from all over the country and outside America. And church family, I can tell you this, that um, we're going to have the joy of having several offerings in the weeks to follow uh, to sort of make up the difference. Ushers, please come. And we'll give a very generous offering tonight uh, to the cause of Christ. We keep meetings like this going. This meeting's so important. And you know, really, please hear me. Somebody else can have a different style, a different kind. Might even teach how to have worship leaders and rock and roll. And that, that's their business. But I know what we want to have here. I know what we want to have here. And we have the right, I'm talking also to our listeners, right? We have the right 
to stand on what we believe as well. And there's nothing wrong. That, that's not cultish. Get that nonsense out of your mind. I could turn this around and say the same but towards you. No, that's just, that's just we believe we're trying to mirror what God would have for our churches. And we're not going to see America come back to God by being soft. We have to take a stand for what is right. Father, these people have been such an inspiration to us this week. I thank you for the expenditure that they have made to come. And many fly here and drive great distances and some by nearby and hotel expense and Airbnb and food and everything that they've done. And we're just so very grateful. Bless their churches. May it be reflected this Lord's Day. May the men and women of God go home refreshed and with zeal and enthusiasm toward thee. May our singing be better. May it radiate the love of Christ. May we have a desire to teach our lessons in Sunday school and preach with greater power and enthusiasm, greater conviction than ever. Thank you for this privilege to give. We pray your blessing upon the offering now in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the preaching tonight, I want to say that, of course, we have been grateful to have all of you here in the, uh, this facility, and of course, the Spanish is at the other property tonight, but we want to say thank you so much for our internet friends that have been watching and listening, and uh, all over the globe, we get a response, and uh, thank you for being such a wonderful family. We love uh, the, media, the uh, ministry of our revival radio. KNBBC.com. We just celebrated on Sunday 10 years of programming. God has blessed that in a marvelous way. And then the 15 minute broadcast is on stations all over the nation and in Canada and on shortwave and on the internet as well. And we're grateful for those listeners and I appreciate God's people. You know, sometimes I know every church has thorns. I, I know that. Every church has difficulties. But I tell you what, I'll take God's people. God's people are the best. And uh, even this week, been so faithful. Our own people, thank you so much. I've been singing 534. I wonder if you could find it there. I like the song, There's Not a Friend. Like the Lord with Jesus. We won't sing very many stanzas, but I wonder if you could stand and sing it on that first stanza with me. Sing it.
friend is so meek and lowly. On the third, that is not a when he is. I did tell you, I said we weren't going to sing them all. I missed one, but uh, you're singing so well. And all the singing this week, thank you. Brother Martinez will sing right after this. Uh, we love Brother Martinez. That happiness and that joy, it's always that way. Always that way. That servant heart. And you know these men on the platform, the orchestra behind me, the staff from the school, the college, the church, the publications, the support staff, the deacons, the church family. That's how they are here. Oh, we have troubles. And we have difficulties. And sometimes there's a little strife and envy. You know, that's Bible. Every church has it because I guess we're dealing with humans, one another. But oh, I wish you could have a church like this. God's people have made it so enjoyable for my wife and I. We, we love this place. And we love the years we've been here. And I'm not setting you up because I'm done, because there is not a bone in my body that says I'm done. There's a bone in my body that says I'm sore and tired. But I, I love what I'm doing. And we love it. We love our people. And I hope that you'll learn what I did in 1977 in a conference just like this. The preacher said, just go home and love your people. And I love these people so much. The delegates were so thankful for you. So Brother Martinez will sing, and then Brother Hudson, we are so excited to hear you tonight. And I love him. I love him that he's direct. And he has conviction. Don't let that bother you. You will be okay tonight. Was there a gift like the Savior given? Sing. You may be seated.
There's a country where no twilight shadows deepen. Unending days or night will never be. A city where no storm clouds will ever gather. Oh, this is just what heaven means to me. What will it be when we get over yonder and we'll join the throne upon the cloud? When at last we see the face of Jesus, before whose image other loves just flee. I'm glad heaven's not just a figment of our imagination. Yep. It's a literal place of 12 foundations, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and streets of pure gold. And uh, we're going there if you're saved by grace. They say about us, some of the religious crowd say about Bible believing Baptists that we're so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. Let me say that's a large, big, massive misnomer. Jesus said, I must needs be about my Father's business. And all that we do is motivated by heaven. If in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. I'm glad there's hope beyond the... I'm feeling pretty spiritual. And uh, I felt like shouting a little bit on that song. Heaven's real to me. I've never been there. But through the lattice work of the pages of God's Word, I've got a glimpse of it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm bound for heaven, praise God. We read of a place that's called heaven. It's made for the pure and the free. These truths in God's Word He has given. How beautiful heaven must be. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. 
fair haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be. I'm glad I'm going. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tear dimmed eyes where all is love and the soul never dies. Are you going there? The truth of heaven ought to do more than just excite us. It ought to motivate us. Turn in your Bible, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 18. And I want to try to help you. I, I believe in humor. Uh, and you that are so hyper spiritual that reveal your ignorance when you open your mouth. The merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Some of y'all look like you need three CCs right now. <laughs> and, uh, but I feel like it'd almost be sacrilegious in an atmosphere like this tonight to try to start off with humor. I don't want to preach. So, 1 Kings chapter 18. We pick up reading an episode of the great prophet Elijah. He was a man of God, a spokesman in a dark hour. Oh, Ahab and Hillary, I mean, uh, <laughs> Ahab and Nance, no, no, no. It was a day of national calamity. A day of national calamity. I mean, God's people, God's chosen people, God's blessed people had reached an all-time low. They did not even recognize the God who brought them out of Egypt's land. They didn't even recognize the God who brought them across uh, the Red Sea on the dry ground. They were at a point where a decision was soon to be made. Whose side are you on? Is it Baal or is it going to be the true and living God? A day of national calamity. A day of notable confusion. You know, if, if God be God, if he's the true and living God, if it's a sad day when we reach a place, even among religious ranks, where we have to specify deity. It's very popular today to be religious. It's never been more popular to be religious. Religion's been embraced. They call it the community of faith. Well, if it's not faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a misplaced faith. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven, given on the way, you must be saved. Salvation is in a person named Jesus. And he was representing Jehovah God, the God that they knew. And he steps on the scene after making an announcement of judgment. Isn't that a forgotten message today? A day of national calamity, a day of notable confusion, a day, if you will, of neutral contentment. These people knew better, they had a heritage. But they were sinning against their heritage. They knew better. They knew who the God was. But they were neutral. A day of no progress. It really sounds like Christendom today. I, I was amazed at the insight that our senator had that stood up here on the first night of this meeting. I mean, he spoke stronger than most independent Baptists that I hear. What he said, they're asking me not to do. All the brethren are asking me to back up, and here's the senator asking us to step up. God may call that man to preach. Amen. And I look at it a day of, of, of natural catastrophes. It hadn't rained since he made the announcement over there. After he came to the brook chair, if he said, Now, Ahab, listen at me. That's in the original, that's in the Masoretic ancient Hebrew text. He said, listen at me, it's not going to rain till I say it's going to rain. Judgment. I don't doubt one bit that the tornadoes that hit our counties 
in Tennessee last night was a judgment of God. The immorality that's promoted from the country music world. Amen. I don't doubt it a bit that the, that the wildfires, that the devastation that's taken place in, in our country, even, even this virus. Say what you will, look the other way, but God's used that kind of discipline. The hand of God's justice may grind slowly, but it surely will grind. Never, never, we should never, God's men should never mistake the, the humbleness and the lowliness and the long suffering of God as if he's forgotten about our sin. I mean, he has forgiven us of our sin. He remembers them no more, but wait a minute, judgment. Judgment begins at the house of God. We step up in verse, chapter 18, verse 1, Elijah has been hidden now I think that's a good thing for a limited time. You got to hide yourself or you show yourself. Yeah. He'd been hidden waiting on God, waiting on God to meet his needs. He had to prove God was alive to himself by the brook cherub in chapter 17. And he had found out that God was able. I want to say tonight, 21st century Christianity, Bible-believing Baptist, fundamentalism, he's still the same God. He's an immutable God. And if he could meet Elijah's needs on a brook, with a crow and a raven and, and water by, by a stream, he can meet the needs of the man of God in this hour. And he is meeting the needs. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Malachi 3, 6 said, I'm the Lord, and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. One of the, one of the great truths that we ought to hold to, I'm talking about with a death grip, is the reality of the immutability of God. Amen. Trends won't change God. Time won't change God. He's the same. Bible said it came to pass, verse 1, that after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show thyself unto Ahab and I'll send rain upon earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab and there was a sore famine in Samaria. It was a, a day of drought. It was a dry time, man. It, it was a parched time. Anytime you see that in the Bible, it pictures the New Testament age, a day where there's no open vision, no, no Bible being preached, no Word of God. It, we're living in a dry time. There's a dearth for preaching. Amen. Said in verse 3, And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. And now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so that when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land unto all fountains of water and unto all brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and the mules alive, that we lose not all the beast. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. And Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And Obadiah was, as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and he fell on his face and said, Art thou my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. He said, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. I want you to underline that phrase, Elijah is here. And behold, he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation, no kingdom, whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they say he is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom of that nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. It came to pass that as soon as I was gone from thee, uh, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come to tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in, in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, uh, he shall slay me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him 
And Ahab went to meet Elijah. Our Heavenly Father, this is a premier text of Scripture to these students of the Bible. And I pray that this ancient revelation would have fresh illumination from the Holy Ghost as I try to preach what I believe a, a message for this hour, a crucial time in this church age. And I, I realize this is written about a nation of Israel. These people are students of the Bible. We rightly divide the truth. But you said those things written aforetime were written for our admonition and learning. They're given for end samples. You're, you're the God who brings Elijah back and at the Mount of Transfiguration. You're the God who's going to bring him back in the tribulation period. You're, you're the God who uses him as an example for us to follow. And I pray tonight, God Almighty, in Jesus' name, that you'd fill me with the Holy Ghost and give me backbone to say everything that I ought to say and give me discernment and wisdom not to say anything that wouldn't glorify our Savior and exhort saints to serve you. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this, this conference. Thank you for Dr. Treber and his stand through these many years. And, and I say give him long life and help. We need him, Lord. And during days of adversity and attack, I pray you'd strengthen him and his family and his wife. And God, help us to, to do our best as we await the soon return of our Savior. We're looking for the blessed hope. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And may long live old-time religion till you come again, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Elijah steps on the scene in a, in a, in a, in a bad day. Uh, it's always good to have an opportunity to serve the Lord. I mean, amen. No matter what dispensation it is, no matter what time we look in history, it's a privilege to serve the Lord. But he steps on the scene after he had been in obscurity for some length of time, after he had announced the judgment of God on a nation, he said, there's going to be no rain nor dew. The judgment of God's come upon a nation that has apostatized, a nation that has embraced idolatry. And he said, there'll be a judgment falling. And the judgment had fallen. And they were living under judgment to the point that now the king had got to so, so uh, urgency behind the effort that he's sending his household governor to go find water for his mules and for his horses. I mean, death was present. And he steps on the scene and, and he said, uh, go tell your king, go tell your master, go tell your Lord that Elijah is here. Let me say that in the hour in which we live, the world needs to be able to find some Elijahs. Amen. 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 And I realize there was a limited time of preparation, but man, it was time to step out. It was time to be seen. And he was there, and, and it was a vital distinction. As you read the story, there's a hundred prophets. There's a hundred prophets, and, and uh, let me say with all due respect to that crowd, they had not been a knee, according to chapter 19. They had not kissed the lips of Baal, but they had no impact. I mean, they might have been doctrinally as sound as this place and this institute, this organism of the church is, and they may have stood for the right things and stood against the wrong things. But that's easy to do in a cave. That's easy to do when they're bringing you bread and water just to keep you quiet. They're in a cave. Never was God's intention for the prophet of God. He's a fourth teller of truth. He's a foreteller of truth. And never was God intentions for God's prophets to be clammed up and hid, but he wants them to be seen and heard. In fact, it wasn't just 100. If you read in chapter 19, there was 7,000. Look at that, 7,000. What a contrast between one, one versus 7,100 prophets. No impact. Having, having no influence. And can I tell you tonight, let me say that the influence of God's man will be judged with much more intensity than your actions. You say, give me proof for that. Well, there's a lot of proof. When the famine came and Elisha was there and he announced that after those lepers had said, listen, there's all kind of, God's blessed us over here. We, we, we hold our peace. This is a day of good tidings. We do not wail. And they came back with a message and they said, hey, there's gonna be plenty to eat in the morning. And Elisha, the prophet, said, hey, y'all, listen, tomorrow morning there won't be any dove's dung anymore on the menu. 
There'll be no asses' heads to eat. There's going to be plenty of bread for everybody. And one of those political leaders, one of those that the Bible describes him as one that the king leaned upon, made this statement, said, well, I know this is in the originals. He said, well, I know what you're saying and all, but if God opened the windows of heaven, Elisha, that couldn't happen. He influenced people against the man of God. He influenced people against the message of God. He cast doubt on what was truth. He was second guessing truth. That was a message. That was a, it was the day when God spoke through Elisha. And Elisha said, Yeah, there's going to be bread in the morning, Hoss. But you're not going to get any of it. He never cheated on his wife, this man who leaned, uh, who the king leaned upon. He didn't steal money from the offering plate. He didn't miss, he, did, he was some pervert. He wasn't abusing any children. Stay with me. Hey, hey, all he did was cast doubt, cast doubt on what God said. His influence was judged. You better be careful how you're influencing this next generation. You, you, be, you better be careful what you say. And you better be careful what you don't say. And you better be careful how you say it, friend. Because our, our influence will be judged. There's a hundred prophets. When I look at it, man, I see he was there. Elisha says, hey, tell, tell the king that Elijah's here. He's there. He was there. There's a vital distinction between him and a hundred in a cave. Vital distinction. I think about man verbally there was a difference. He was saying something, they were saying nothing. Oh, it's easy to preach in the cave here. We can all say amen and we can preach to one another. But what about when we leave here, friend? There's a vital distinction. He was there to vindicate deity. In verse 24, chapter 8, you know the story. He said, if God be God, then follow him. If God be God, then follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. He's there to vindicate. As long as you don't specify deity in our generation, it's fine. You just talk about God generically, the church of your choice. Worship God, but when you got saying God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, hey, when you start specifying, when you start saying Jesus is God, when you talk about the impeccability of Christ and you talk about the Lordship of Christ and you talk about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Hey, friend, you will quickly get ostracized from the religious community. But he was there to vindicate, did he? He was there to verify direction. When he made the statement, hey, Ahab, Elijah is here. Go tell the king that there's a representative of God, an old-timey, old-fashioned, leather-lunged, high blood pressure. Hey, Bible, hey, there's a representative of God Almighty, and he's here. Boy, we need some Elijahs. Look at it with me. There's a quiet majority. I was riding down the road, and I don't know much about the computer or the phone, but I have a YouTube on my phone. And if you look up Mays Jackson or B.R. Lakin, it'll start showing you different preachers. And, and it came up title of a message. It said, The Silent Church. And I thought, man, I need to listen to that. Because that's probably somebody busting hide. On a church, it's not got a bus ministry. A church, it's not confrontational and soul winning. And I said, man, I'm, I'm going to soak this up because I need, I, need, I need a little ammunition. I tuned in, man, and it was some effeminate sounding, potato string backbone, rose water squirting. And he said, now, we don't need to be so confrontational. And it was some kind of promotion of lifestyle evangelism. Go cut somebody's grass for a month before you mention Jesus. Somebody help me. Because you don't want to offend them. Let me help you just a minute. Hey, they're already going to hell number one. What are you going to do, offend them and send them to hell number two between now and then? The silent church. I thought, man, I ain't listening to that. I turned that off quickly. But it sure made a live 
They made a live contrast between the Elijahs of that day. Here was a, here was a majority, a quiet majority. Jot it down. I mean, it was a time where more prophets of God, more prophets of God than there were prophets of Baal, but no message. I mean, they were quiet. They were quiet concerning the perpetual apostasy that was going on. And I'm talking about doctrinal direction. I'm not talking about backsliding. I'm not talking about unconfessed sins. I'm, I'm, are y'all with me? I'm talking about the doctrinal decay of this hour. The doctrinal departure, the great falling away. Hey, that's not gravity losing her pull. That's not the second come. That's not the rapture. A great falling away is what we're seeing in our own ranks. And here was the brethren. I mean, man, they were very, they was all, I mean, never been a knee. They hadn't kissed Baal yet. I mean, man, doctrinally in line. But hey, friend, they were not defending the faith. In the day of apostasy, Jude said, earnestly contending for the faith once delivered by the saints. Either you are contending or you're compromising, friend. There is no in-between ground. There's a hundred of them. They're in a cave. No doctrinal stability. No, no directional specifics. Well, we just love everybody. Well, so do we. But everybody's not right. Amen. This ecumenical kumbaya mentality. I'm, I used to call it secondary degree, separate 30. I'm not rubbing shoulders with somebody who rubs shoulders with somebody who rubs shoulders and ordains women deacons. God never has called a woman to preach and he never will call a woman to preach. If any man desire the office of bishop, he desireth a good work. Let him be the husband of one wife. That's Bible, friend. Hey, you can turn it any way you want to. God never has called, never will. Joyce Myers is no more a preacher. Look at me, friend, amen, than, than Donald Duck is, amen. We're living in an hour where these quiet majority, I'm sure well, they outnumbered the 800 false prophets, hey, 400 prophets of the groves, 400 prophets, 450 prophets of the bell, 7,000 hadn't been the knee, got 100 old leather lung, high blood pressure, knew how to preach, sons of the prophets. Hey, over there in a cave, Would have been something if they had to come up and backed up old Elijah when he started calling down fire. No devotion. No devotion to scriptural standards. There are some boundaries that the Bible has. Somebody asked her the other day, said, y'all, y'all are legalists over there. I said, no, we just were separatists. We, would try, we try to promote holiness in the fear of God like the Bible tells us to. No, y'all don't let women sing in the choir that's got on breeches, do you? I said, well, no. I said, do you let your wife go naked to Walmart? He said, well, of course not. I said, you're a legalist. Everybody's got a line somewhere. Everybody's got a line somewhere, friend. No, no, they were quiet. I mean, they were quiet concerning the perpetual apostasy. They just didn't say anything, just ignored it. It's going to go away. No, friend, it has to be dealt with. It has to be called out. Hey, those, those brethren who, who, do not, who do not adhere to the traditions, we are to mark them and avoid them that they may be ashamed. That's Jude, man, they have no fear at our Feast of Charity because they know we're not going to call them out anyway. Oh, they were a quiet crowd, the majority. They were quiet concerning perpetual apostles. They were quiet concerning political agenda. Well, I just don't believe we ought to bore people with that. Well, isn't it funny that John the Baptist didn't get his head cut off for preaching the gospel? And he was lifting up Jesus, you know. He said, behold, the Lamb of God was taking away the sins of the world. That didn't cost him his head. In fact, either the Pharisees said, he's a, shi he's a shining light. It's when he, uh, when he addressed Herod and said, you're shacking up, hoss. It's unlawful. 
It's against the law. It's not Bible. Hey, it's wrong. When he called out wrong, that's what cost him his head. That's what cost him his popularity. That's what cost him his likes on Facebook. Somebody help me. His following. Oh, what a day we're in. We're being infiltrated. Our church is being indoctrinated. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, until the point they're becoming contaminated. They've got our people so duped, they're strumming them like a cheap banjo. Well, you know, all sin's the same and everything. Y'all shouldn't judge. That just shows their biblical illiteracy. The Bible said, he that's spiritual judgeth all things. How are you ever going to exercise church discipline and not have some judgment? How are you going to mark somebody as walking disorderly and not have some spiritual discernment? It's preaching time now. They're strumming us. You know, well, you know, I'll send, no, all sin will send you to hell. But not all sin is the same. There's degrees of sin. When he came down there to Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, look up in here. Whatever y'all do, when you leave out, don't you look back. Don't you look back on a lifestyle of sodomy. Marriage is holy. Marriage is, 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 is a sanctified thing. It represents Christ and the church. It's a great mystery. And anything that combats Christ and the church and confuses ma- marriage is a great mystery. I speak in church. And he said, if you look back on that same sex, that lifestyle, should you turn to a pillow of salt? She didn't turn to a pillow of salt for looking back on a moonshine still. Somebody help me. They're strumming you, man. This this, this silent majority. I I want to preach tonight on that, on on the silent remnant. It's about time to get out of the cave. They were silent about a proclaimed authority. If you notice, each time that Elijah moves in these texts, It's always preceded by these words, and the word of the Lord came unto him. You watch this crowd when they start dropping their standards and swapping their music. Next thing is they're not even going to adhere to this King James. One of them tweeted not long ago, one that used to be one of ours, he's gone. He says this, he says, well, he said, I wouldn't worry about what version if I'm not reading the one I got. Now hold on, I'd rather you not read one if it's not inspired. You'd be better off with a comic book, friend, than some Bible that has omissions, some Bible that has deletions, some Bible that changes virgin to young girl. You'd be better off never knowing. God's, hey, God has more mercy on ignorance. Amen, neighbor. Oh, it it does matter. It does matter. We have an authentic book. Ain't but one of them. I could quote with the help of God, and you probably know I could, several texts, proof texts concerning the word. I like that Psalms 119, 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servants loveth it. That ought, right there we ought to just stop and do like a conga line around the building. Dun, 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 dun. Somebody help me. Just praise God, thy word is very pure. Don't get excited or anything. Y'all stay calm. But if you've got a King James Bible, thy word is very pure. And their, their, ser- their servants love it. Hey, 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 thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy word is very pure. Therefore, thy servants loveth it. Thy servants. I'm talking about the ones that's not in the cave. It's accurate. The accuracy. I mean, they're starting to second guess now, you know, what he said in John 14. By the way, you mid-tribbers that might have slipped in here, he's coming back. And we're not going to have to endure three and a half years of it either. You can hang around for three and a half. You can endure all seven. I'm pulling out on the first load, praise God. Revelations 4.1. And I saw a door open in heaven and the voice of a sound of a trumpet talking to me saying, come up hither, praise God. One day the trump of God's going to sound. Oh, gravity's going to lose her pull and his robe of flesh will drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell. 
farewell, sweet. I, hey, I'm leaving out of here, praise Amen. God. Amen. The application. They're silent about applying. Oh, we believe the Bible. We don't need theatrics and personality. All we need is to preach the word. What are they talking about? They're just boring people. <laughs> if they studied the Bible, they'd find the old time. They, Paul beckoned with his hand. There was a style. Preaching and teaching is two different things. Teaching imparts truth. Preaching brings you to a decision. He gave some teachers. He gave some. But when the world in its wisdom knew not God, it's pretty bad when you don't even know God. When the world in its wisdom knew not God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, 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 preaching to save them that would believe. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering for the time will come. And the time has come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust. Lust. What is lust? It's a desire for the forbidden. Lust is not always a sexual connotation. It's just what the authority, my Bible said about the church, where two or three get in my name, I'm in the midst of what things you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, what things you loose on earth shall be loose. The church has authority. The church has authority to set dress standards. The church at Hollywood shouldn't set our standards. And I'm gonna say it tonight just to clarify my position. I have no confidence in a preacher whose wife's walking around in leggings. Don't look down, sir. Look, back, look up in here. This is where the preaching is. I have no confidence in a man walking around in sprayed on blue jeans. So tight you put a quarter in her back pocket read if it's heads or tails. Amen. That's wicked. That's worldly, friend. They don't want to make, they just, they, they, well, we believe you ought to look like a Christian as long as you don't specify what a Christian ought to look like. The church has been given that authority. They can bind it or loose it. That's New Testament. And they all act like they're so smart. The shepherd talk. We're not sheep. Don't be nervous. Israel was the sheep. We're the church. We're soldiers. I need help. We're in a warfare. Sheep don't put on helmets and breastplates of righteousness. Where do you get that from, friend? Hey, go to the lost sheep and feed my lambs. Hey, we're, we're the church, friend. Hey, we're warriors. We're in a fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Endure hardness as a good sheep as a good, blessed, fired soldier of the Lord. Amen. This bunch of soft bunch of junk. That's the crowd wanted Cruz. Don't you bow your head. Cruz the wine bibber. That's the crowd all crazy about Cruz. Cruz whose daddy was a oneness preacher. Didn't believe in the Trinity. Jesus only preacher. They tried to crucify us. They tried to crucify me and Tim Gammons. Ronnie, Ronnie S Simpson, Brother Bobby, because we said we didn't vote for a deacon when we voted for a president, we voted for a leader. Don't you bow your head. Y'all Trump people now, ain't you? You're just crucifying us. Hey, hey man, everybody okay? Y'all got awful quiet. Now listen, I don't know much about fishing, but when I get hung up on a stump, I just circle around until I get unhooked some for you. <laughs> I said, I'm a Trump man, friend, and so are you. This bunch of liberal crowd, you can't even be a Christian, vote for Trump. I'll tell you right now, you can't be a Christian and vote Democrat. Baby killing, sodomite loving. Hey, friend. Hey, good neighbor. Hey, friend. I'm talking about this crowd done got silent. And if they ever do poke their head of the cave, they watch from afar off. They, they polish the tombs of the prophets. They want to bring out names like Roloff. Roloff wouldn't even preach in their church. They want to bring names like Seitler and Curtis Hudson out, and they wouldn't even go to their churches if they invited them. Polishing them tombs, tombs of the dead prophets. Amen. Silent against application. 
Let me say, if the Bible says don't do it, it still means don't do it. It's not a book of situational ethics. It's a book of absolute truths. If it's ever been wrong, it's still wrong. If it's ever been right, it's still right to do. I need that red Bible, praise God. Amen. Hey, I'm talking about friend. They were silent. Hey, they were quiet. They quiet. What a contrast. One man of God, toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball, with idolaters, challenging a nation to truth. They in the cave. I got to asking myself this quiet majority, why are they in the cave? Look at the text. I mean, Obadiah is a good Christian. I mean, if he was a Christian, somebody help me. He was a believer. I need help. He feared the Lord greatly. What did he do, man? He, he thought he was doing a good thing. I'm going I'm to get these preachers in this cave on some retreat. I, I hate the word retreat. It sounds like we're losing. We don't go on retreats, we go on charges. We have couples charges. They've had singles charges. We don't have retreats. Sound like, sound like we're losing the thing. Amen, friend. What I'm going to do is put these, these hundred prophets in a cave and feed them bread and water. You know, by the way, standing for God, it was a little bit better for Elijah. He was getting meat and bread. That's King James. It was a peaceful retreat, no complications. It's easy in the cave. Who's going who's gonna to oppose you in the cave? No confrontation. No conflict. Scream as loud as you want to. Shout as loud as you want to. Pre- I can see them in the cave preaching to one another. Uh, praise God. If I was out there with Elijah, this is what I'd say. Now we know Elijah's a little bit extreme. He's a loose cannon. I preach so many messages and the pastor gets up and does his collateral damage after he gets through. I I, I wonder why did he invite me to come in the first place? In the cave. They're in the cave. No influence in the cave. Why are they in the cave? Because it was a peaceful retreat. Let's just stay in the cave, man. It's nice in here. Kumbaya, my Lord. Let's all hold hands in the cave and burn a candle. How pleasant for brethren to dwell in unity. They love that one verse. What about that? How can two walk together except they be agreed? When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him, Brother Tony. Yeah, let's read it again. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even enemies. You don't have many enemies in the cave. That's why they get along. Their common bond is if their wife dresses immodest. I'm just preaching what God's laid on my heart. It all draws a line right there. That's where they write you off. All, they don't care what they believe as long as, as long as they have no standards. They can all get along on that. Amen, good. Don't you bow your head. I'm not ready to pray yet. Look up in here. They're in the cave, friend. Why are they in the cave? Well, it's peaceful. Just a little peaceful retreat. I thought they was in the cave because the persecution was rigorous. Can I say it is? It's going to cost you. I mean, it was death threats. It hadn't rained in some two and a half, three years yet. I mean, it's been a long time. The ground's parched. The land's pagan. They're plotting against Elijah. We want to kill you. Obadiah said, man, you want me to go tell uh, Ahab and Jezebel that I've found Elijah? Man, not only they want to kill you, they'll kill me. <laughs> persecution. The varied persecution. If they, won't, if they can't hate us one way, they'll hate us another way. Yeah, man. It's vicious. They, have, they always talk about being so, they're always so smooth, those, those in the cave, the cave dwellers. The silent remnant. They're always so kind. They're always so smooth. But, but how, we're mean-spirited. But what, what about my family? 
are they guilty of something because I preach hard? Why do you gotta be mean to my family about it? They're vicious. They'll, they'll attack my children. They'll attack my wife. Hey, hey, hey is everybody, don't look down. They have no boundaries. It's a vicious attack. I mean, it's, it's, it's a varied attack. It's a, the volume of the attack. They use their mouth. Vipers always use the poisons in their mouth. Jesus addressed those religious Pharisees. That was that crowd. That's the crowd that's in the cave. If they're saved at all, somebody help me. Hey, there's a crowd that's in the cave and they're using that Facebook, they're using that social media and man, they're real loud with it. I mean, it speaks all over the world with one tweet. Why don't they just get mad enough to call out names? What is the difference between painting the picture with words, insinuating about a man or a ministry? I mean, they say we shouldn't call names, but they sure do. What are they, artists? They've done everything but paint my fat head. Somebody help me. Or they think we're so dumb we don't know who they're talking about. But that's okay. They're loud. They're loud in the cave. It's okay to call names if it's Joel Osteen or Joyce Myers. Just not some of this crowd who's defected. We can't call them out because that's too close. That's getting in the quick. Hey, friend. That said they're in the cave. Why are they in the cave? Persecution rigorous. I tell you why they're in the cave because they've made a public refusal to identify. They don't like it. They want to ride the coattails of their rearing. It was good enough to get them saved. It was good enough to get their family saved. It was good enough to be brought through Bible college and Christian school and, and, and have, a, have an edge. But wait a minute, now all of a sudden they don't want to identify. No titles, no boundaries. They're in the cave. I'm telling you, public refusal. Jeremiah 6, 16 stands in the way and see and ask for the old paths. Ask for where is the good way and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in that old path. There's a public refusal to identify. There's a public refusal, friend, to specify. Well, are you a Bible believing Bible? Well, I'm a conservative. They're kind of like Peter, you know, at Pilate's Hall. Hey, aren't you one of those followers of Christ? <laughs> well, I voted Republican. I mean, I don't want to be labeled. And if they are, well, we're in the convention by name only. We're by name only. They're really not, they're just by name only. That's like me putting a sign, I am a sodomite. Walking around. People that know me know I'm not a sodomite. It's just a sign. Somebody help me. Well, if you're not one, don't wear the rainbow flag then. Somebody help me. Or the rainbow socks. Amen, friend. Everybody okay? That's too close to them for me. I need help. Don't y'all die on the platform. Hey, man, right there, Brother Tony. I ain't even got to my message. I'm telling you, God helped me to get there. I got a message. I got a message. This is what he said when he came to him. Art thou the man that troubled Israel, Ahab? He said, no, thou art the man, that you and you, you and your fathers. And so he brings them to this. He says, well, what we're gonna do is decide who's the true and living God. He said, if God be God, follow him. And if Baal be God, follow him. If you wanna say follow, you can sound like a northerner. I say greetings from Dixie. Somebody say amen. Hey, follow him. If he's follow him. 
and they answered him not a word. There ought to have been somebody in that crowd if they was god fair say, look up in here, Elijah. I'm with you, big daddy. You talking about following the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Je- Hey, hey, Elijah, count me in, I'm in. But they answered him not a word. They, nobody knows whose side they're on. Nobody knows what side they're on. Nobody knows what stripe they are. They're just generic, monotone, headed for Calvinism. All of them want to be a Jonathan Edwards. Somebody say amen. Everybody okay? It's preaching time. Read a little sermon, say nothing. I've heard so many messages. What is he trying to say? Am I the only one who sits in conferences and goes? And finally, I make eye contact with a brother and I go, hey. Is this guy for it or against it? Which side? Oh, where's he stand? Oh, yeah. Public refusal. The public view is always justified. They always try to find some obscure way to twist a verse and accuse you of being prideful. But you're not the one taking selfies of your Jeep and your beard. Somebody say amen. Yeah, man. I don't believe I've ever had a selfie on social media. I don't even have a social media. But they're accusing us to stand and preach truth as the prideful ones. No, we just know whom we have believed in. And I'm not ashamed, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's a power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I have no apologies to make for the position that I stand on. Boy, they're quiet, aren't they? You're going to be an Elijah. You may be the only one in town. About time to come out of the cave. I see the quiet majority. Then I see the quest of the minority. He makes a statement that's almost a revelation of his disappointment. He said in verse 22 of chapter 18, he said, Elijah said unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450. I understand he was not in the dark. He had already been told by Obadiah that there was 100. But 100 in the cave aren't prophesying. They're not, they don't remain. He's telling the truth. This is God breathed. He wasn't haphazardly forgetting there was 100. He knew there was 100. Wouldn't say a blessed fired thing. A prophet that's not prophesying is not much of a prophet. He said, I remain. The word remain means to continue to exist even when those of like people or those of like mind cease to exist. You look it up, Google it. That's where I found it. I learned that much on computer. That's where I found some of y'all's Facebooks too, straight out of hell. Amen. Everybody all right? Hey, he said, I'm the only one that remains. What a, what a disappointing statement. We got a hundred prophets that could be standing. It could be, you got 7,000 that have not been a knee, have not kissed the image of Baal. Imagine that in a, in a, in a providence of, of, of Palestine and Israel, smaller than the state of Georgia. If we had 7,000 prophets in America, it would be 150 or more per state. I'm not good on statistics, man. I went to public school. Somebody help me. I mean, 150 old-time Elijah-type prophets in every state. Man, we would be in revival. Imagine in this day, 
Man, there'd be one on every corner. Those 850 prophets of Baal and those, uh, those adulterers, those tree huggers up there in the groves, uh, hey, they would have been intimidated. They would have been quieted. They would have been in the cave. They would have been hiding. But the timid, amen, moderate, liberal, soft, evangelical sympathizer, wife-run pastor, wife-run pastor. How are you going to pastor people? You can't, you, can't even, you can't even keep your wife in control. It's preaching time, friend. She tells you what she's going to put on. Don't you quit listening at me. I know the qualifications of a bishop. It's preaching time. I've watched these, hey, hey, I've watched these preachers do pretty good till you get right there. Even the pulpit's got a little quiet on me out here. The purpose is to remain. No, notice the quest of this minority. This quest of the minority, the one, Elijah. I mean, he had a quest that was lonely. Some of y'all need to put it in your mind. Hey, if you think you're getting some kind of big entourage and following, standing for the old time way, you had not read the scriptures too much. Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. He was lonely. The Bible tells us it was a laboric. He had a, a labor. He was a lonely experience. It was, a, it was labor intensive. The Bible said, verse 30, Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of some to Jacob. And the word of the Lord came. He did it. We're, we're wanting to try to make some impact, and, and it's with some kind of an ease. You know, Pastor friendly. How do you do that? How do you spiritual? How do you engage in spiritual warfare? And and not get into some clashes. Amen. 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 It's a labor. Wherefore we labor, whether absent or present, we be accepted of him. In light of an empty tomb, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as don't your labor's not in vain in the Lord. We're laborers together with God. Whatsoever thy hand finds us to do, do it with all thy might. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. The Bible said in Galatians 6, be not deceived. God is not bought for some man's sword that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, of the flesh reap corruption. If he sows to the spirit, of the spirit reap life everlasting. So let us not grow weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It ain't quitting time. ain't quitting time. I thought about it. It was a legitimate expense. I mean, man, here was the minority. It was a lonely experience. It was, it was labor intensive, but then it was a legitimate cost. Notice what he said. He said, now, I'm going to stack this altar back up. We're going to put a bullock on there. What I want you to do is go get me 12 barrels of water. Hadn't rained in three and a half years. The king sending out his governor of the house to go find just a stream to water his stock. But the man of God's got 12 barrels of water in his savings account. <laughs> he didn't have to raise money for plastic surgery for his wife. Somebody help me. <laughs> hey man, it's preaching time. Yeah, I'm talking about man, he's got 12, he's got, it's a high dollar commodity. And he says, don't you go dump them over there on that altar. He said, do it again. Can you imagine what people say? Man, that guy's crazy. Look at that preacher, man. He's invested. He, he, why don't he get a life? That's all he does is he gives and gives. These people just give and give. Yeah, you know, it's, it's our way. It's a Bible way. Larry Burkett and all that bunch of Dave Ramsey, my hind leg. There's no shortcut to blessing. You know how you get? You give. 
The Bible way to gain is given. All your wisdom amounts to nothing. You sacrifice and God blesses. He got serious about this fire. He was trying to prove God's alive. He's there at a day of apostasy and idolatry and he's outnumbered and he had to put some investment in. He proved to God he's dead serious. How serious are you? How serious are you? He said, dump all my life savings. Take my 401k. Take all of my water that I've been gathered up. I had a little savings account up there at Sheriff. Go dump it on. I'm giving it to God. Ain't no telling what old Jezebel would have given for a drink of that water. He, all he did just compromise just a little. Hey, Amen. I'm telling you, it's a legitimate expense. And you know what happened from there. I'm getting to my message now. Can I take one sip? That's about an hour and a half worth of preach right there, friend. I was preaching in a revival over in North Georgia, and I did that, and the next night they brought me a communion cup for water. <laughs> There's a silent majority there, quiet, there in the cave. There's the quest of the minority, challenge the godless generation we live to prove our God's alive. But then there's the question I find within this text that's monumental. Turn to chapter 19. I mean, man, this question is fixing to be revealed in chapter 19 has spanned the time since Carmel Till today, he's seen the power of God. No doubt he's exhausted. He's just beheaded 850 false prophets. Somebody help me. Now, I know that's under the law, and I know that's a different age, but we give a lot of room for young converts to grow. Amen. We got a bus ministry. I mean, man, we give a lot of room for young, but when it comes to false doctrine, we're not going to put up with that for two seconds. And Calvinism is as much a false doctrine as ordaining a woman preacher is. We're not entertaining those thoughts. We're cutting it off. Here he was and he's tired and he's hearing the threats. And here comes a question after he's heard these threats. I mean, man, he's, he's seen the hand of God. Mount Carmel. That's the apex of his ministry. Look up in here just a minute, everybody. It don't get no better than Carmel, Big Daddy. I mean, I can't wait to see the video. When we get to heaven, I can hear those prophets of Baal. Bow, now, 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 wow, wow. Bow, now, 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 what about it, Baal? Bow, now, 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 brand down the fire. Bow, now, 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 the roof is on fire. Bow, now, 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 what about it, Baal? No fire. All they had was some smoke coming up off the floor. Somebody help me. And a few pink lights around the cross. Somebody help me, neighbor. No fire. And he walks up and prays 63 words. And it's not in the text, but I believe he said, young and y'all step back. And it consumed the stones, the sacrifice, the water, the dirt that it stood on. And the people begin to say, the Lord, he is the God. He's an exclusive God. He's not a God. He's not a choice. The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Man, he leaves there. A nation comes back to God. There's a turnaround. There's revival. We find him tired. He takes a bite and he said, it's fixing to rain. Now, I, I, I hear the sound of abundance of rain, he said. Fix the rain, Ahab. And God empowers him so that he outruns a chariot. Can you imagine? I mean, it's mud now, but it's raining. 
It hadn't rained in three and a half years. It's mud. Man, you talk about a dusty place. And now water's falling. He's marring up to his knees, but he's out running the chariot. He gets over there and Ahab's wife, old, old Jezebel, she threatens him. Yeah, if it by tomorrow, this same time, you're going to be like him. Y'all know the story. Look at it. He's at Horeb, the Bible said in verse 8, and he arose and he did eat and drink, chapter 19, verse 8, and he went in the strength of the meat for 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, and he came thither unto a what? Uh-uh. Not my hero. Not my man. He belongs on a mountain. He's the vocal representative. He's the visible representative. Hey, he's the vital. He's vital to the future of Israel. What, what you're doing, what? Man, don't get in no cave, man. That's where the liberals are. That's where the moderates are. That's where the defectors are. That's where the traitors are. That's where the compromisers are. And the Lord came unto him, the word of the Lord, and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Listen at him, verse 10. And he said, I've been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts of children of Israel and forsaken thy commandments, stoned down thine altars and slain thy brother with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said, he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. What mount? Carmel. Go back where the fire's at. You don't belong in this cave. Elijah, man, you know better than that. Go back to the mount where you, where you saw the fire fall. Go back to the mount where there probably, he could probably still hear the echo of the crowd saying, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. How firm a foundation. He said, yeah, go back to the mount. Bible said, and behold, the Lord passed by with a great strong wind. It rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. That, that just represents the long suffering of God. How come he didn't get killed in an earthquake? He's, he's right here blatantly disobedient. God told him to go to Carmel. But then the still small voice came, and it said again, verse 13, it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood at the entering of the cave. He stood in the entering end of the cave, and behold, there came the voice, same voice, same God. What doest thou here, Elijah? I done told you to go back to Carmel. And he said, oh. I've been looking at the Facebook <laughs> and they've been making bad tweets about me <laughs> and they made a parody account about me <laughs> and I don't, even have, I don't even have a tweet account but they made one about me and put doctor in front of it <laughs> and they're being mean spirited. And I'm jealous for the Lord. Said the identical same thing that he said before. And the Lord said unto him, go and return into the way of the wilderness. Instead of going to the mountain, just if you want to go the other way, you go the other way. I want to say tonight, there's a, there's a question that's monumental. What are you doing in the cave? Well, I'm not really in. I'm standing in the door. That's too far. What are you doing in the cave? Some of us, man, after all these years of blessing, after all these years, God's, I mean, we know it works. And if it didn't work, it's right anyway. We don't go soul winning because we see results. We go soul winning because we're commanded to go soul winning. 
It's not some kind of percentage thing. If I knock on 100 doors, I'll get 10. If that was true, man, we'd have the fastest. It all, now that's not the way it is. We go because we're obedient to the command. Whether we see results or not, whether we see growth or not, whether we see, hey, whether we see, whether we're received or rejected, hey, we go because we've been told to go. Go back over yonder. The well, everybody's done left the mountain, Lord. Yeah, go anyway. Be obedient. I mean, man, he was unsatisfied with the results. It didn't turn out like he wanted it to. He thought he'd be invited to the sword conference. Somebody help me. He thought he'd be invited to some leadership conference. I need help. Man, I'm representing God. I'm doing what's right. They don't, uh, everybody okay? Don't, hey, everybody all right? I was invited to preach here. I say what I want to, amen. He thought it would be, well, man, everybody's gonna like me. I'm gonna be, in, I'll write me a new book. He was unmoved by the reproof of God. It's a pretty bad day when you line up in a cave and God says, get out of that cave, hoss. And you sit there and bow up on God and walk up to the door with a mantle all around your face. <laughs> they, they're talking about me. <laughs> they don't like me. I wear it like a badge. <laughs> they don't like me. Whoa! I got another one. One lady came the other day and said, man, I just can't stand you. I said, get in line behind my wife. Old Billy Kelly was preaching. A woman after he got through said, she said, if you was my husband, I'd poison you. He said, if you was my wife, I'd drink a gallon of it. He was unsure. Maybe, maybe, maybe he was in that cave. Maybe he slipped back because he was unsure of all that earthquake. And what did the fire mean? And what did the earthquake mean? And what did those strong, what was that about? Well, I can tell you it wasn't because he was happy. The Lord having his way in the whirlwinds and the clouds of the dust of his feet. It wasn't because he was pleased with your actions, Elijah. It was time to get out of there. He's shaken by what he saw. He's saddened by what he felt. What doest thou in this cave? He was stirred by what he heard but he didn't move. I'm through preaching. But I wonder tonight how many of you are on the brink of following family members into the cave. I, I, you would have thought, man, if anybody's going to stand at Carmel and re remain, I, even I, remain, it would be old Elijah. But God sees, man, He's changed his direction. If you want to go to the wilderness, go ahead. I've got a Jehu. He's a wild driver. <laughs> I got an Elisha who wants a double portion of what you had. He don't just want a little bit of what you had, Elijah. He wants twice as much. And if that's the way you want to go, go on to your wilderness. Or you can come back to Carmel. You know where the caves are out there in the wilderness? Amen. Some of you are following your family. I've watched great men fall because their family fell. It's hard, man. It's hard. It's hard when your children go another way to stand. It's hard when your when when your when your family, your immediate family, laughs at you, and you're doing what you were taught to do, what they were taught to do. But man, now they got children that are co-pastors and God help us, whatever. Ain't no more scriptural. Somebody help me than, than, a, than, a, than a mason lodge. Somebody help me. They'll drag you back in the cave. If you're not careful, they'll, they'll drag you back in the cave with them. Papa, let me tell you something. If, you're, if, you, if your daughter married some liberal and they're going to some, you know, river, church, river, the river, 
the oasis. Man, that sounds like a bar room. Every time I, midnight at the oasis. Somebody help me. I mean, I just have flashbacks. But my mama listening to the radio, no, no. Stay with me. They'll drag you in there if you'll let them. Pop all next time they have, well, we're going, preacher, Traber, we're going to have to go over there tonight. They're having the Christmas program. And my grandson, you know my daughter married that boy. He goes to that non-denominational and everything. And they, they love the Lord and all. People's getting saved over there. And, but we're going over there. He's, he's, he's playing a long-haired Jesus tonight. And we're going to go over there. i tell you what I'd do, Papa. Before they drug me back in the cave with them. I'd go over there, and as soon as they read, I have another version that didn't line up with that King James. I'd get up in the middle of the service and walk to the back doors. I'd make sure my insurance was paid up. And I'd slam both doors as loud as I could. I'd get outside, and I'd pop the clutch if I had a standard chip, and I didn't, I'd stand on the brake for a little while, and I'd, la- I'd, I'd lay drag all the way out that parking lot. So when that long-haired grandson got home and said, Mama, why come Dad, Papa left so upset? The girl knows why he left. That generation of compromisers know why. Why was Papa so upset? I would, I would leave that impression on my grandchild's mind before I'd leave an impression that I endorsed that kind of direction. The dread drags us in the cave. So if it's not our family, sometimes it's our foes. We're so, we're so scared, you know. I mean, man, you know, help me now. What will the brethren say? It's always been the enemy. The brethren's always been the enemy. It's funny in town, man. I, we, we have bus ministry. We, we, I, there's a few dope dealers in our area. I know that's not like that here. <laughs> Oftentimes, our bus workers come in and have a, hundred dollar bill in their hand. I said, where'd you get that? They said, I want to give you that. So where'd that come from? Well, you know, on Route 4. What about Route 4? Well, let me go visit Route 4. <laughs> Don't tell Tracy. <laughs> She'll start a route. Somebody say amen. You know Route 4, you know that fellow that stands on the corner, he used to ride our buses. He never got saved, but he knows. I mean, I'm talking about dope dealers. Prostitutes. I was sitting in a Waffle House in Tennessee. I'm almost through preaching. I was sitting in a Waffle House in Tennessee, and a man came up and laid his hand on my back. Daddy had just passed away. It's kind of interesting. It was back in March of, of, of 95, and a man put his hand on my back. His name was Curtis Hudson. He, ran a, he owned a beer joint. He owned a liquor store. Curtis Hudson spelled the same way. He put his hand on my back. He said, Tony, I want you to know something. He said, your daddy would be proud of you. This is a man who runs a liquor store. It's called Bubba's Market. When you come to Murfreesboro, I don't want to see you there. <laughs> he reached over and picked up my ticket. I've never had a pastor in Murfreesboro pick up my ticket, Brother Epley. <laughs> yep. Let's remember that. But I've had some, I've had some bootleggers pick it up. Y'all stay with me. If you're not careful, you're going to let the brethren drag you back in. You're going to let the bruises drag you back in. You're going to let the blunders drag you back in. Let's get out of the cave. Our Heavenly Father, we stand tonight in in an hour of apostasy, an hour of apathy. The Laodicean church age has never been clearer painted than it is of the calendar of 2021. Soon to be worse than ever, 2020, 2019, we've seen a drifting. And I'm asking you tonight, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you would help us like Daniel of old to purpose, predetermine. Help us like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Help us to make our mind that 
Come hell or high water, live fat or die skinny, whether it's easy or hard. But we're not going back in a cave because it's easier. We're not going back in the cave because it's popular. We're not going back in the cave because there's more brethren there than on the outside. But I pray we'd do our best by the grace of God, not in a prideful stance, but in humility and lowliness. Say, by the grace of God, we're going to stand in this dark hour. I want to ask you to forgive me in the hours and the many opportunities where I've silenced opportunities to represent you where I second guessed an urge, a message. I pray, God, that you'd help parents in this room. As goes the home, so goes the church. Help daddies in this room to get out of the cave. Help mamas in this room to line up. Parents to stand together. Oh, sweet Jesus, I pray that across this nation, across this globe, that you'd raise up another generation like Elisha, who even when some of the older brethren go back in the cave, by the grace of God, they stay right where they should be and waiting on an endowment of power and waiting on a mantle to fall where they can have an impact on their generation. Let it be so. Lord Jesus, we'd be naive to think that everybody in this room tonight saved. We know the majority of these people profess Christ as a Savior, but there may be somebody in here lost and undone. Heads are bowed, our knives are closed. Let's stand together all over the house. If you're here tonight and you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Can I tell you that Jesus is in a saving business? And I know I represent this church and Dr. Jack Treber when I say if you're lost tonight, you're among friends. And Jesus wants to save you. There'll be somebody around these altars, somebody here that'll help you. Lost friend, why don't you come trust him tonight while they're singing this, pass me not, O gentle Savior. He wants to save you. He can save you. But he won't save you against your will. Preacher friend, are you tempted to be in a cave tonight? Young, young pastor. Young pastor. Let's quit making excuses. Time to get out of the cave. There's a lost and dying world looking for some Elijahs. He said, Obadiah, go back and tell Ahab that Elijah is here. There ought to be an Elijah in every town across this country. If, if not one, two, three that represent our Lord, our Master, our Savior. Tell him Elijah is here. They ought to be able to find you easily. They ought to be able to identify you easily. Do they know where you are? Our Heavenly Father, help us to have your will and way. In Jesus' name we pray. While on others thou art calling, oh, do not pass. Father, we've been so blessed this week to be together. Thank you for every man of God that has stood here in this pulpit to preach the Word of God. Every session that's been taught, every song that's been sung. And Lord, I thank you so much for the wonderful choir and uh, the organ.
orchestra and the sound and the nursery workers and the, the housekeeping people. I thank you so much for the people that have worked in food services and parking lot attendants and security and uh, maintenance and cleaning. What a wonderful time together. Thank you for those that have been in the convention center, those that have driven buses and shuttles. Lord, you've been so good to us, and I pray for every man of God that on this Sunday, if you should tarry, our time change Sunday, that we would uh, stand with conviction and more authority than ever. May the people of God have a desire for a man of God to say it straight, and may they respond, and may they be lifting the, his hands as he preaches. May God's people pray for their man of God and love them and support them. Bless the preacher's wives. God, may they not be weary. So important that they continue to stand by the man that you've called them to stand with. I thank you for all the labors you give us in the work of the ministry. Those that come us alongside to help God's people the best. Lord, that I thank you for. Please give safety for those that will travel back. Bless these closing hours and moments of the Spanish conference as well. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Brother Tony. I tell you, I love him. And I agree with him. And I'm not ashamed of him. Please be seated. Duncan Reinhardt's one of our college boys. And he is from Brother Johnson's church in Reading. And this week, he's made, where's, where's Duncan at tonight? Is he in the house? He might be working. Duncan, right there. Stand up, will you please? And your pastor knows all about this. But we're so proud of you. And pastor, where's Brother Johnson at? You're, you're in his family. You're, we're so thankful for him. He's a wonderful young man. And thank you. And all God's people said he was, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm surrendering to worldwide missions. And we're proud of you. God bless you. Amen. 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 I don't know if Nathan Shook is in the house tonight. Nathan, are you in here? Right there you are. Will you stand? And he, uh, this week, he's getting ready to graduate, but God's just worked on his heart. He goes, I, I've got to serve God full time. And he's ready to go. He's already got a place. God bless you, Nathan. Give him a big amen, will you please? We're, we're proud of both of you boys tonight. God bless you. It's wonderful. That is great. It's, it's been such a good week for me personally. I, you know, when you have meetings like this, really the, the person that needs it most is the person that's helping to host it. And uh, you've helped me so much. Your music, your, your spirit, fellowshipping. I love to get, getting together for coffee in the morning and being with you all day long. Thank you. You've been wonderful friends. I hope you pastors, I think every pastor in America has my phone number. Uh, don't answer it, but I st you still have my phone number. But I, uh, I, I, I'll do anything I can within reason. I'll do anything I can to be a help and a blessing to you. Uh, you know more than I do, but I tell you, I can pray for you. And I promise I'll do that. Brother Flood, is there anything else? I, you need to come and make some announcements. Please come. Are, are, is there any something thing? You, will you come and tell us about that? Pastors of KMBBC Radio in the uh, Convention Center has something for you. They do. The KMBBC booth in the Convention Center has something for our senior pastors. And so you want to make sure that you stop by a, a custom KMBBC keychain as well as a CD from KMBBC for all of our senior pastors. And uh, obviously we're so thankful for all of our delegates, the senior pastors. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's get out there tonight. And uh, Brother Reamers, I don't know if you're in the house still. He may have just slipped out over there. But um, get, get your hymn books ordered or your psalm books or Sunday school curriculum on Fitly Frame, that new uh, series for adults and for people learning more about the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, and whether, whether it was back in Sunday school on, on Sunday that we were together, thank you for those that are early birds. I love that time. Big crowd here. Thank you for the Sunday morning service. Thank you for the great meal that you provided for the early birds, Brother Boyd and his wife and those that work. And all week long, the, 
Brother Everson, thank you for the college hosting so many things this week, and it's been wonderful. And I thank God for you. For our church family and ushers, I wonder, Brother Sam, if they could go back there. We have that picture of the car this week, and if you'll just have it ready at the door, and if you want uh, that 57 Chevy, I hope there's extra because I have something I want to do with them, so just don't take them for wallpaper in your house, if you will. Brother Tony, did you, are you still here? Thank you very much. All God's people said, yes. Amen. Yes. Imagine what would have happen in America if every man had that courage. Bernie Sanders does. He just tells you what he believes. He's a legalist too, I guess. I don't know, but he just tells you what he believes. And I, I love that. I, I, I admire, I want that. Uh, I think God's people need a man of God. Just a tremendous, tremendous uh, message. Well, we're going to sing a song. But before we do, let's start up that engine one more time. Shall we do that tonight? Are you ready up there? <laughs> We have used the video this week of this vehicle reminding us about various areas of our life that need to be constant in observing, making sure we're doing things right. The last journey we take in a vehicle, this body that God has given to us, is a journey to go home. And that's my prayer that as we close out the conference here in just a little bit, that we'll remember that one day is coming that day where we'll make that final journey to heaven. I hope it's been a good journey. I hope for my life and your life that we can look back and say, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. So you can sit in a tree stand and freeze if you want. Or on the side of a river and get nothing all day fishing. Or you can get into cars. I'd like those that want to surrender to get, get into the car ministry to come forward right now. By the way, question for you. The 57 Chevy is the classic. It is the classic. There's a 57 Ford. They were manufactured right over here where it is now the Great Mall. The 57 Ford or the 57 Chevy? Which one sold the most? Ford did, and Fords were ugly. <laughs> and they're not classics, but the 57, you're going to be a classic, some of you men that are great preachers of the gospel. Have that page. Let's sing a cappella, 449. Shall we stand together? Page 449. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful week. Thank you for being our friends. Let's pray for one another that God uses. Jesus Christ is made to me for 49 a cappella. Let's sing it. Jesus Christ is. 